l'honorable chef de l'opposition. Merci beaucoup, Madame la Présidente. Je ressens aujourd'hui, comme beaucoup de gens dans cette pièce, un, un certain sentiment de déjà-vu, puisqu'il y a un an, presque jour pour jour, notre regretté chef Jack Layton se levait pour prendre la parole dans cette Chambre dans des circonstances euh, quasiment identiques. Il le faisait afin de s'opposer à la loi spéciale que ce gouvernement déposait et qui visait à obliger les travailleurs en lockout, important de retenir qu'ils étaient en lockout, de Post-Canada à retourner au travail. Ce qui est important de retenir quand je mentionne le lockout, c'est parce que c'est ce gouvernement lui-même qui les avait mis en lockout. Donc, dans le jargon de la négociation collective et du droit du travail, il y a un mot pour ça. C'est un mot qui fait partie du langage ordinaire, mais qui en fait a un sens spécifique en matière de relations de travail. C'est la question de mauvaise foi. Et il y a rarement eu un exemple aussi flagrant de mauvaise foi de la part d'un gouvernement que celui-là. N'oublions pas, le gouvernement regarde des travailleurs chez Post Canada. Ils étaient en train de travailler. Le gouvernement les met en lockout, les empêche de travailler, se tourne d'abord et dit Ah, oh, mais nom de Dieu, ils ne travaillent plus, ces gens-là, qu'est-ce qu'on va faire Ça prend une loi spéciale pour forcer leur retour au travail. Et voilà qu'on était embarqué dans un exercice qui est une illustration d'une tendance lourde des conservateurs depuis qu'ils sont arrivés au pouvoir de bafouer des droits collectifs de s'attaquer aux travailleurs, d'utiliser tous les moyens à sa disposition majoritaire pour envoyer un signal clair aux employeurs cette fois-ci. Le signal, c'est que c'est barre ouvert sur les droits des travailleurs. Laissez-vous pas faire les conventions collectives, la Cour suprême, les droits garantis par la Charte des droits et libertés de la personne. Pour un autre jour, tout ça, nous, on est là pour imposer notre nouvelle loi et ordre c'est barre ouvert pour les patrons. Voilà le message des conservateurs, Madame la Présidente. Après Post Canada, bien sûr, il y a eu Air Canada. Ils n'avaient plus même besoin de dégainer. La réaction était si immédiate, ils étaient en train de gagner leur pari. Aujourd'hui, c'est le Canadien Pacifique. Donc, ce gouvernement a imposé trois lois de retour au travail au cours de cette seule session parlementaire. Trois lois spéciales adoptées en catastrophe en moins de 12 mois. Comparons maintenant cela à ce qui s'est passé au cours des dernières années et vous allez comprendre la différence et le message qu'ils essaient d'envoyer. Il y a eu seulement, pendant toutes les années 90, il y a eu seulement un total de neuf lois de retour au travail. Pendant toutes les années 80, et rappelons que les conservateurs étaient largement au pouvoir aux années 80, il y a eu seulement six loi de retour au travail. Donc, vous voyez la disproportion totale. Ils sont rendus à trois lois en douze mois. Comme mon ami et collègue, le leader parlementaire de l'opposition officielle vient de le dire, ça fait au-delà de vingt fois maintenant qu'ils imposent un baillon. Ils utilisent une guillotine pour enlever le droit des parlementaires de parler sur des choses aussi importantes que le budget. Voilà la tendance lourde de museler, de baïonner, de faire taire les élus du peuple ici dans cette Chambre, Madame la Présidente. Aujourd'hui, c'est bien plus que le conflit en, euh, canadien pacifique qui est en cause. Oui, il y a eu celui d'Air Canada. Oui, il y a eu celui de Post Canada. Mais cela tient à un élément déterminant de la démarche conservatrice qui est d'apaiser les conditions de vie des Canadiens à tous les égards. Example after example since the Conservatives came to power of lowering the standard of living of Canadians. This is the first generation where we've seen the middle class start to lose. Over the past 25 years, the earnings of the top 20% in our society have increased, a tendency that we observe throughout the history of the country. But for the other 80%, Living conditions, wages, the middle class, they have actually seen that drop. It's the first time in Canadian history we've observed that. And it's a heavy tendency. It's one that we keep observing. And it's a series of actions by this government. And this, today's attack on collective bargaining rights, on labor rights, on rights that are preserved and guaranteed by the Charter, preserved and guaranteed and enforced by the courts, the, 
the Conservatives are again attacking workers and their rights in this country. Some of the choices that they've made over the years, of course, have resulted in the pressures that they now say they have to react to by cutting everything in the budget. For example, the, we look at the employment insurance. Take a 30 percent pay cut, ship yourself a couple of hours out of town, take any job that presents itself, otherwise you're going to lose the em employment insurance that you paid into with your own money and your employer paid into, you're going to lose that right. You remember, Madam Speaker, in 2009 when they double-closed the door that the Liberals had already closed when they had emptied out, and it had gone all the way to the Supreme Court, they had emptied out $50 billion from the employment insurance account. Now, they turned that into general revenue of the government, so a lot of people said, well, it was government money before and it's government money now. What does that change? Well, here's what it changes. The $50 billion in question was paid into the employment insurance account by every single employee for a specific purpose, to take care of them during the cyclical ups and downs of the economy. It was paid in by every single employer. Whether that employer was earning a good profit, breaking even, or losing money, you still had to pay in for every single employee. When they emptied out the EI account, they created a $50 billion fiscal space. What became of that $50 billion fiscal space? It was turned into tax reductions for the richest corporations. Now, the Conservatives don't like it when we say for the richest corporations. They'll argue that it's for all corporations. Let's look at the facts. A company that was breaking even or losing money certainly didn't benefit That's right. from a tax reduction. It wasn't paying any. And in these tough economic times, especially for any export sector, including the fisheries, the forest, and manufacturing, a lot of them were losing money or barely breaking even. So the money that they had paid in for a specific purpose to provide that insurance in case of unemployment, when the 2008 crisis hit, that cupboard was bare. And it had been emptied because that money had been turned over to the wealthiest corporations like the banks and the oil companies. That's the record of the Conservatives and the Liberals, and that's why the NDP is standing up today and saying... <laughs> Ils sont en train de déséquilibrer l'économie qu'on a bâtie depuis la Deuxième Guerre mondiale. Il y a des pays comme le Norvège qui, comme nous, sont très riches en ressources, mais ils ont appris à pallier aux défis que cela représente. Nous, on n'a pas cette sagesse-là. Développement débris des, na des, nat des ressources naturelles sans appliquer le principe de base de pollueur-payeur et un résultat qui est en train de nous déséquilibrer l'économie qu'on avait bâtie depuis la Deuxième Guerre mondiale. Il fut un temps où les Canadiens de Langley jusqu'au St. John's pouvaient compter sur un bon emploi, sur un salaire juste pour soutenir une famille. Mais ils pouvaient compter sur une pension qui leur permettrait de prendre une retraite digne et sur un système d'assurance-emploi justement accessible. Mais non. Lors d'une conférence dans les Alpes suisses avec des milliardaires il fallait que notre Premier ministre décide d'épater la galerie et de montrer que lui aussi allait se bomber le torse et donner une leçon de morale aux moins bien nantis et leur apprendre que même s'ils avaient travaillé toute leur vie dans le secteur de la construction, même s'ils avaient travaillé dur dans une usine, ils ne travaillaient pas assez fort à son goût parce qu'il allait ajouter deux ans à leur vie de travail, leur soutirer 12 000 de leur poche parce que selon lui, ils n'étaient pas assez productifs. Par le même fait, il retirait ses emplois du marché en enlevant des possibilités d'emploi à la jeune génération, une jeune génération qui est déjà en train de payer la plus lourde dette écologique, économique et sociale de l'histoire. De nos jours, les jeunes qui font leurs études de premier cycle au Canada empruntent en moyenne 30 000 dollars pour un bac universitaire. Quand est-ce qu'un jeune couple qui doit 60 000 dollars au début de leur carrière est censé s'acheter une maison? Mais quand on vide la capacité économique du gouvernement d'aider à l'éducation postsecondaire comme il le faisait auparavant, voilà le résultat. Il crée la condition, il le monte du doigt, exactement comme le lockout des travailleurs de Poste Canada. Il crée la situation et dit ben, on ne peut plus aider. Il n'y a plus d'argent. Qu'est-ce qu'ils ont fait avec l'argent? Ils l'ont donné à des sociétés qui ne créent pas d'emploi. La Banque royale n'a pas créé d'emploi l'année dernière. Sauf que l'année dernière, les banques à charte canadiennes ont fait 30 milliards de profits. Ils ont pris 15 milliards en bonnie pour leur cadre. Voilà ce qu'ils ont fait avec cet argent-là. Ils n'ont pas créé d'emploi. Nous, au moins, on a une vision de dire si on a un espace fiscal disponible, on va le 
dirigés vers les entreprises en fonction de leur création d'emplois. Voilà. C'est ça qu'un gouvernement est censé faire. This government is trying to tell Canadians that we have to accept less, that we should accept lower wages, weaker pensions, and they are trying to create for employers an unlimited pool of cheap labor. It's, it's a commonplace and it's almost a caricature, but it's the Minister of Human Resources last week in response to a question in a press conference who specifically cited the creation of workers for McDonald's. It's not a hyperbole on the part of the opposition. That's what they actually said. One of the ministers responsible for finance said, well, of course, if a teacher is looking for a job in Newfoundland, we've got jobs in the mines. This is their philosophy. This is money that belongs to the workers. They think that it belongs to McDonald's, and they're creating a system for employers and evacuating workers' rights. And this special legislation, forcing the workers back to, on their jobs despite the collective bargaining process, is just a full illustration of exactly what they're up to, lowering workers' rights, lowering the ability of the middle class to pay for itself, evacuating the capacity of the government to provide services. That's the agenda of the Conservatives. And it's important to note that they're not just affecting any one union or any one group of people, but all Canadians. That's the Conservative vision. Under their policies, we're becoming the first generation that will leave less to our children than what we inherited from our parents. New Democrats will not let that happen. <laughs> Collective bargaining is guaranteed by the Charter and by the Supreme Court of Canada. Collective bargaining benefits all Canadians. Better wages, workplace safety, a 40-hour work week, a weekend where you can actually be with your family. The list goes on, but the Conservatives are determined to dismantle it. They're undermining this right, and it's unprecedented in Canada. Air Canada, the government didn't even wait for a strike to begin to bring in legislation, didn't bother to allow negotiated settlement to happen. The Labour Minister says she will intervene in any dispute she feels impacts the economy. Last time I checked, every working Canadian contributes to the economy. That basically means no more rights. The Minister is saying no labour negotiation is safe from Conservative interference. The approach is unbalanced, it's heavy-handed, it's against the Charter, and it will be enforced, but it'll take time. Taking sides helps no one. Sends a terrible message that legislative settlement is the new labour relations norm in Canada. No incentive for the parties to negotiate in good faith if they know the government will step in. Why would an employer, who's already received the clear signal from the government, we saw it in Canada Post, we're seeing it again, what possible incentive do they have to bargain in good faith with their employees? They could just fold their arms and say, you're going to be forced back to work. We don't care. Of course, the government doesn't care either, but they're willing to do the bidding of any employer that asks. That's what we're here standing up against today, Madam Speaker. <laughs> The government's creating a slippery slope where no one will get a fair deal. Canadians relied on collective bargaining rights for decades. The government must respect the right of future generations to, the, to live with the same security past generations have had. What we're leaving our children is a defining issue of our times. As I mentioned, the, the middle class is struggling like never before. Income disparity at levers, levels not seen since the Great Depression. We are one of the richest countries in the world, and yet we're one of the countries with the greatest disparity between the richest and the poor. Ça vaut la peine de le remarquer. Entre les mieux nantis de notre société et les plus défavorisés, le gouffre au Canada est parmi les plus élevés au monde, et ça ne fait que s'accentuer depuis que les conservateurs sont arrivés au pouvoir. On n'a pas vu ça depuis la dépression des années 20. La sécurité que les Canadiens ont déjà senti commence à disparaître, et c'est pas du hasard, c'est voulu. Regardons ce qui se passe au Saguenay, Rio Tinto Alcan, parce que quand ils ont acheté la société Alcan, ils n'ont pas seulement acheté des usines. Rio Tinto, une société étrangère, est devenue le propriétaire du lit de la rivière Saguenay. Pensons-y, là. Il faut que ça soit au bénéfice net du Canada, c'est écrit dans la loi, quand il y a une telle 
reprise de contrôle d'une société canadienne par les étrangers. Petite parenthèse, avant, il y avait un déclenchement d'une analyse à un certain niveau. Maintenant, il le porte à un milliard de dollars. Donc, des choses qui étaient analysées auparavant ne seront même plus. Mais regardons ce qu'ils ont fait même quand ils ont fait des analyses. Ils ont coché « bénéfice net du Canada pour la reprise d'Alcan par Rio Tinto ». Qu'est-ce qui s'est passé? Les autorités en Europe responsables de la concurrence ont dit « telle partie qui fait des métaux euh, super spécialisés, vous allez vous en départir ». Pas de problème, ils le vendent à un Américain. Qu'est-ce qui s'est passé après? Les Américains l'ont flippé à une entreprise aux Indes, dans le multinational indien. Qu'est-ce qui s'est passé? Ils ont dit, ce n'est pas très bien là-bas, on va le déménager aux États. Les emplois perdus du jour au lendemain. Aucune protection des travailleurs. C'est ça, l'attitude des conservateurs. Rio Tinto est encore en... Et, et, regardez bien ce qui se passe là. Ils sont encore en lockout chez Rio Tinto, à Alma. Ils en ont cure. Pour eux autres, c'est comme un avertissement. Les barbares arrivent, ils démolissent le village, ils laissent les gens à l'entrée du village. Ils disent « Regardez bien le modèle qui s'en vient, vous avez intérêt à vous ranger ». C'est ça qu'ils sont en train de faire, de démanteler, de détruire des décennies, des générations de protection qui aident à toute la société en démantelant tout notre système de protection des droits sociaux et des droits des travailleurs. Let's look at the conservative net benefit, shall we? We've just looked at Rio Tinto Alcan in Alma in the Saguenay-Lac-Saint-Jean region. Workers have been on lockout for six months. Net benefit for Canada have everybody at locked out, Madam Speaker. Inco, the Conservatives approved the takeover by Brazil's Valley in 2006. Valley proposes in 2009 to end defined benefit pensions for new employees. Then the USWA goes on strike and it lasts nearly one year. That's the future for workers under the Conservatives. Falconbridge, Swiss-based mining company Extrata, absorbs Falconbridge in 06. Takeover deal says no layoffs for three years. 2009, Extrata lays off 700 people. 700 families lose their living because they don't understand that a net benefit means not just a net benefit for the shareholders, but also a net benefit exactly. for the families that work there. Here's one of the best illustrations of the Conservatives' approach, and I'll start with a reference to what happened during the 2011 general election, because our current Prime Minister went out and visited a lovely company in London, Ontario, called Electromotive Diesel. He used it as a backdrop. He used it as a model. As a matter of fact, since uh, there was nothing that they wouldn't do during the election, they touted a $5 million tax break, no strings attached. You don't have to create any work. You can just take the $5 million bucks. That was what he did during the 2011 election campaign. Because, you see, a U.S. company called Caterpillar had bought Electromotive Diesel in 2010. So what happened in the months that followed? January 2012, 450 Electromotive Diesel employees are locked out. Why? Well, because they were being unreasonable. Because they were only being asked to take a 50% pay cut. So, and that was all part of the money. After all, the company had been given $5 million bucks, so they were only asking for 50%. Otherwise, it must have been 60% they were thinking of. February 2012, just a few months ago, the plant is closed. The operations moved. What a net benefit for Canada. No. The government has announced plans last week to raise takeover review to a billion dollars, and there'll be even more reckless foreign takeovers that'll fly under the radar. Other working Canadians are forced to fight for their pension funds that they paid into for their golden years. Moi, je me souviens quand le premier ministre s'est levé pour dire qu'il ne toucherait pas aux pensions. Ça, c'est une de mes fourberies préférées de la part de ce gouvernement. Le premier ministre a dit on ne toucherait pas aux pensions. Quand ils ont ajouté deux ans de travail et soutiré 12 000 dollars, le ministre des Finances s'est levé et a dit Wow, we said we wouldn't touch. Pensions. We never said we wouldn't touch old age security. As if for the average Canadian, it wasn't one and the same thing, their revenue when they were going to retire. Unprecedented attacks on workers, unprecedented attacks on the middle class. That's the legacy of the Conservatives. That's why we're here standing up today, Madam Speaker.
comments. Uh, the Honorable Member for Cape Breton Council. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. And uh, uh, Madam Speaker, I know the, uh, the uh, leader of the official opposition will be very familiar with, uh, with the past history and uh, work back to work legislation uh, that's been presented in this chamber. And uh, what we found on the part of the government uh, through uh, some of their interventions today, they, they sort of try to blur the line between legislation that was presented in 1995 and their actions today with this back to work legislation and, and really in the, the last number of uh, uh, months. And uh, Madam Speaker, you know, in 1995, when the VSCN and CP were all in the midst of, uh, uh, of uh, labor disputes and uh, really rail had grind to a halt, uh, and, and uh, it was a liberal government that brought forward back-to-work legislation, uh, we know that uh, the NDP supported that back-to-work legislation at the time. So I'll ask the leader if he could share with the people watching this debate at home what the difference is now and what the difference be between the 1995, uh, put it in context between 1995 and now. Uh, the Honourable Leader of the Opposition. What I will allow myself to say, Madam Speaker, is this. We have never before seen a government develop and deliver such a concerted attack on workers' rights. It's systematic. <laughs> Our vision is to build a Canada where no one is left behind, where we leave more for future generations, not less, where we talk about what we can accomplish, not what we can't do. That's what the Conservatives are about. All negative, we shouldn't be doing this, we should chop the size of government, we can't afford this. They're removing some of the extraordinary programs and services and ideas and institutions we've built up that are a reflection of our fundamental goodness as a people our specificity as a nation, and that's why we're standing up to say that all of those values will be defended by the new Democratic Party. That's our vision for the future versus theirs. Uh, Madam Chair, the uh, Leader of the Opposition consistently attacks Canadian business and their profitability. At the same time, he Claim, puts his hand on heart and claims that he wants to protect the pensions of the workers who are invested in those very same companies. I'll give you one example. He mentioned Canada Post. The Canada Post pension plan. So the Canada Post pension plan. Its first top five holdings are all banks and oil companies. Every single one of them. All of the returns, therefore, that are paid to those unionized mail deliverers come out of the profits, the after-tax profits, of banks and oil companies. When he tries to divide businesses against workers, he, he might learn that in our modern economy, in many cases, they are the same people. Workers, through their pension funds, own businesses. His proposed tax increases on those businesses will not only suppress jobs in the business, but suppress the returns to the pension funds he claims to want to protect. How does he reconcile that obvious mathematical contradiction? Uh, well, it's going to surprise my colleague to, uh, <laughs> when he hears me say that I actually, for once, agree with something that the Conservatives say. You see, the Prime Minister thinks it's unfair that only union members should have a guaranteed benefit pension. And you know what? We agree with them. Because everybody should have a right to a guaranteed benefit. So instead of doing like he does, which is always seeking the lowest common denominator, to seeking what we cannot do, our vision is to provide the best government we can, develop programs that see people to their retirement and the ability to live with dignity. Because you know why, Madam Speaker? Not only do they deserve it after a lifetime of work, but it's good for the economy that retired people are able to take part in that economy. Yeah, yeah. Merci, Madam President. Ça me fait plaisir de me lever aujourd'hui pour poser une question suite au euh, merveilleux discours 
qui a dressé un portrait de la population, un portrait de la situation qui est très bien à part. Le monde des députés, des députés du Grand Mont, chef de position officielle, je pense qu'on a fait ici la démonstration dans cette Chambre, avec ce discours-là, de la trajectoire et de la direction dans lequel vont les conservateurs qui mettent des pressions à la baisse sur les conditions de travail, les conditions de vie des familles québécoises canadiennes. Et ça, pour nous, au NPD, c'est inacceptable. Et je voudrais demander, je voudrais demander aux députés d'Outremont, est-ce que les conservateurs, selon lui, est-ce que les conservateurs sont en train de changer le cadre général des négociations collectives? Parce que avec Post Canada, avec Air Canada à deux reprises, et maintenant avec le Canadien Pacifique, est-ce qu'on est en train de attaquer la libre des négociations, qui est quelque chose qui est protégé par la Charte des droits et que nous, au NPD, on veut défendre. Oui, et puis ce n'est pas une vue de l'esprit, Madame la Présidente. C'est un droit garanti par la Charte et appliqué par la Cour suprême d'une manière constante au fil des ans. Je vais sortir du cadre des relations de travail pour un instant et parler d'un sujet connexe en termes du comportement du gouvernement. On se souvient tous du travail extraordinaire qui a été livré par ma collègue, la chef adjointe du NPD, à Vancouver pour un site d'injection sécuritaire. Les conservateurs ne voulaient rien savoir pour des raisons idéologiques. Ils ont dit que c'est un non-sens, on ne peut pas avoir ça. La Cour suprême, dans une, une décision inédite dans l'histoire de la jurisprudence canadienne, a samoncé le gouvernement conservateur et lui a dit qu'il ne pouvait pas baser ses décisions sur une idéologie sur de la superstition ou sur des a priori conservatrices. Non, ils devaient les baser sur quelque chose qu'ils ne connaissent pas, les faits, les voilà. preuves. Voilà la différence. Voilà. Voilà. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I'm just going to briefly follow up on the question that uh, the uh, leader of the opposition got from the uh, Liberal Party. I thought it was an excellent question, but we did not get an answer, Madam Speaker. I would like to know, and I think most Canadians would like to know, that if uh, they've supported back-to-work legislation in the past, so the NDP party has, uh, in particular with this organization, when does the leader of the opposition believe that it's time for government to act for all Canadians and that he would support? Is it after a week? After two weeks, after six months of nothing happening in terms of uh, uh, commercial rail activity, when would the NDP, when would they tell the Canadians when they would finally act on their behalf? Thank you, Madam Speaker. The difference in point of view uh, between the member who just spoke and us, of course, Madam Speaker, is that we actually believe that it is in all Canadians' interest to have a system of labour negotiation, a system of labour rights. We believe that that's in everyone's interest. And the dis difference between what exists with their government and any other situation that has existed before in the history of Canada is now we have a government that is sending such a clear signal to employers, don't even make an effort, don't even talk. We before Air Canada even went out, they had special legislation enacted. Before they even started discussing, so what possible interest is there? for any employer to negotiate in good faith. There is none. I, I regret. Order, please. I, I would like a uh, little order. The Honourable uh, Leader of the Opposition has the floor, and uh, he would like to respond to the question. I couldn't, order. Hear, I couldn't hear the exact words, Madam Speaker, but I just took it as an encouragement to continue. <laughs> never before happened in the history of Canada, that the Parliament of Canada is used as a management tool. We are not management tools. We are here to represent and stand up for all Canadians, including the workers' rights. That's what we're talking about. Last very brief question, the Honourable uh, Member of Dart for Dartmouth Coal Harbour, 30-second question. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Madam Speaker, and, and I am uh, pleased to ask a, a question, a brief one, uh, to the uh, Leader of the Opposition. I'd like to ask him uh, what do you think it says about this government that they're so prepared to take away the rights of working people, the rights of, the, uh, of, of senior citizens, the right of people for a protected and clean environment, for a protected and sustainable fishery. What does it say about a government that is prepared to trample all Canadians' rights? The Honourable Leader of the Opposition, 30-second response. It's a question of vision, Madam Speaker. Ours is a vision of sustainable future where we respect the rights of future generations. Theirs is a vision of how we can do less 
They're always removing things. You know, 50 years ago it was decided in this country that no family would ever have to decide between having their sick child seen by a doctor and putting groceries on the table. In a meeting with the, the finance minister before Christmas, $31 billion taken out of the proposed funding for Medicare. That's the type of institution they're dismantling. They're dismantling workers' rights. They're dismantling all of the good things we've built up in the, over the generations. We're going to stand up against that, and we're going to stand up for a future.